Okay, welcome. We are about to start a new section of this course, and we're going to be shifting our thinking from um, the underpinnings of digital circuitry, um, instantaneous rises and falls and voltages, and we're going to be considering um, AC signals, and these are signals that are sinusoidally varying, and that's going to change a lot of the way we think and consider transmission lines. It will still be just as important, but we're going to have sort of different um, aspects that are going to come into play. Uh, and so in this lecture, we're going to introduce the concept of phasers and describe what we mean by impedance, uh, expanding on our understanding of the impedance that uh, um, we have already introduced in the first por portion of uh, this course. So this lecture is divided up into three nuggets. In the first, I will introduce what we mean by AC signals and why they are different from the instantaneous um, DC signals that we considered before. Then we'll introduce the concept and the math behind phasers. And then finally, in the last part, we're going to recast the idea of a wave as a phaser in, um, in, uh, in sort of a frequency domain um, uh, mindset. So part one here will be introduction to AC or alternating current signals. So when we say AC, uh, I'm referring to sinusoidally varying, right? But the frequency itself could be any frequency. Uh, and on the lowest side, some of the, the places where we may deal with this is on the power grid, right? The power grid is at 60 hertz. Um, both the, uh, uh, the transmission and the, the propagation of the signal from you know, power plants to your home uh, is all done at 60 hertz alternating current. Um, the details of how that's done uh, can be found in other courses. But what's important is that um, you have a system that is designed specifically to transmit 60 hertz. If the power grid were, let's say, 500 hertz or zero hertz, it would be designed very differently, right? The, um, the components and the, the physical layout of the power grid is specifically tailored for 60 hertz, and we're going to get into uh, why that's the case. Now, in a lot of applications, uh, instead of having digital circuitry, you have uh, effectively an analog signal where you have uh, kind of a single center frequency and you operate with a bandwidth around that, right? Any sort of RF application like, uh, um, you know, cell phone towers in particular, I wanna mention radars as being one of these applications. Uh, so in a radar system uh, and, and uh, uh, you know, a, a radar is, um, uh, you know, a, a simple example of shooting out an electromagnetic wave, um, having that wave reflect off of, uh, you know, an airplane or a bird or anything else um, and it comes back to you and you pick up that reflection. Um, and on the left, you'll see an example of a radar that, you'll, that you may see at any runway. And the next time you're taking off in the airport, look around, you might find this little orange uh, um, radar dish. It will be spinning around about, uh, um, at, uh, about 12 RPM or so. Uh, and so the, radar, the way a radar works is that it operates with a center frequency, perhaps one gigahertz, perhaps 100 megahertz. Uh, and it broadcasts something very close, right? It, it may have a bandwidth around that that may modulate that signal. Uh, maybe instead, you know, for a gigahertz may actually mean a gigahertz plus or minus, uh, you know, one megahertz or, or one one thousandth of that, right? So there's a small bandwidth, but typically there is a center frequency and your radar is very constrained around that center frequency. And these are uh, sort of characteristic to a lot of systems around communications, around Wi-Fi, around cell phones and, and 5G, where there is a single frequency um, and a small bandwidth around that. Um, on the right, by the way, just for your interest, is an example of a, an image that is actually taken with the radar. So this looks like it's a camera image, but it's not. Uh, it's actually a particular type of radar called synthetic aperture radar. Uh, they can produce very high resolution images. And if you don't recognize this, this is the US Capitol building, which you can see very fine detail, including like, you know, fine scale trees, um, and individual cars. Um, and uh, it's actually pretty impressive what some of these radar systems can do. But in order for this to work, you have to have very precisely designed um, you know, systems to uh, deliver that wave to the antenna, broadcast it out, and then receive it on, on the way back. Uh, and that's gonna draw on a lot of the transmission line theory that we're about to introduce here in this course. A other prominent sort of RF application that's getting a lot of attention these days um, is 5G. Uh, and, and eventually we're going to see 6G, right? So um, in cell phone networks, as, uh, as we sort of turn the bandwidth up and try to have more and more data, um, not just from your cell phone to cell phone towers, but from cell phone towers to cars, uh, 
um, and to your appliances in your homes, right? There's a whole, um, you know, smart grid, um, smart city, um, you know, uh, internet of things, IOT system that's developing, all of which demands higher bandwidth. And the way to get higher bandwidth is to step up in frequency. And that's gonna complicate things as we're gonna see the higher you go in frequency, um, when you're dealing with sinusoidal signals, there's going to be some um, difficulties that are going to arise, even when you're doing something simple like designing a circuit board to bring a voltage from point A to point B. Uh, it turns out to be a surprisingly complicated problem. Um, and how you design antennas for this and how you deliver signals to antennas, there's a kind of a, you know, a whole world of, you know, around this. So let me just give you a quick picture of what we mean when we talk about sort of modulation around a center frequency, just to sort of, um, you know, uh, you know, broaden your understanding here. So if I tell you that a system like a Wi-Fi router, for example, is operating at 2.4 gigahertz, just as an example, uh, if you look at this center panel right here, that's what we might call the carrier wave. And this is just a standard uh, 2.4 gigahertz sinusoidal wave, very simple, nothing changing. Uh, but oftentimes when we want to impose a signal on top of that, we may have a digital signal that we want to communicate using that carrier wave. And an example of that is shown in the top half, right? So we are transmitting a digital signal, but we have an analog channel in order to do it. And so there are lots of ways to modulate the carrier signal in order to communicate the digital signal that we are trying to send somewhere. Uh, and so there are lots of ways to do this. One example is shown in the bottom, it's called binary phase shift keying or BPSK. Uh, the way that works is you basically flip the sine wave upside down uh, whether it's a one or a zero, right? So every time you see there's a transition from one to zero or zero to one, uh, the sign of the sine wave or the polarity of it flips upside down. And if you have a receiver, you can detect that flip and therefore code whether you have a decode, whether you have a one or a zero and pick up your digital stream. This is one of many ways to do this. But even this particular modulation scheme, again, operates with a center frequency of a gigahertz and a small bandwidth around it. Uh, and so oftentimes we're designing systems that are basically um, uh, um, set to handle just one frequency. Um, and we're going to consider what that means if you know what that center frequency is. So in this section, there's really going to be kind of some very mind blowing things that we're going to be covering. Right. So uh, if you remember in the, the first portion of the class, I started off by saying that everything you learned in circus class was wrong. Right. And we sort of went through what that really meant, this idea of if I have a battery connected to a light bulb, I can't instantaneously have the battery know the light bulb is there. There's gotta be a ping ponging back and forth in order for that steady state to be established. So I think we sort of modified a little bit and I, I you know, that maybe was a, was a little bit of hyperbole, but um, it was an approximation. Uh, and that's valid when the circuit is very small, then you can sort of pretend this doesn't exist. But if the circuit is large enough compared to a wavelength, uh, now you start to need transmission line theory to understand what really happens and to understand things like ringing, um, for example. So the theme of what we're going to be covered next is I'm, I'm gonna you know, return to my hyperbole roots and say much of what you thought is real what is actually just imaginary, right? So what does that mean? Um, I'm gonna make the claim now, and we're gonna see that this is true, that sometimes a short circuit and an open circuit are actually interchangeable. And in some ways they're kind of the same thing, right? That doesn't make any sense right now, but you're gonna see later, it's actually kind of true when we consider this single frequency treatment. All right, um, here's another one that's gonna blow your mind. A capacitor is just like an inductor and an inductor is just like a capacitor, right? Um, that certainly makes no sense with basic circuit theory. They're actually kind of the opposite of each other. One converts voltage to current, the other converts current to voltage. Uh, how can they be the same thing? We'll see, they kind of are if you see things from a different perspective. Um, if you take a transmission line alone, which is just two wires or a coaxial cable that ends in nothing, uh, with that, you can make a capacitor or an inductor with any value that you want, right? That's pretty neat if you think about it, right? If, if uh, you know, one day you uh, go to DigiKey or spark fun and you order a, a one millihenry inductor and then you're so excited and it comes in you open the open up the box and you see two wires and i'll say what what the heck is this um that's not actually going to happen uh but i will show you that a transmission line can actually be used to make a capacitor or inductor with any value that you want 
All right, impedance um, depends on the size of a circuit. Now, this is a new concept, right? Impedance is simply, okay, I've got a resistor. I put a voltage across that resistor, and I know I'm going to make a certain current appear across that resistor. The ratio of that is kind of like the resistance or the impedance, right? Uh, so what does it mean for the impedance to depend on the size of a circuit? Does it really matter if my resistor is an inch versus 10 inches? Why should that depend? on the size. And we're going to see later that the size of the circuit has dramatic impacts on what we're going to define as impedance. All right. The other thing is you can design RF filters that simply have transmission lines and resistors and nothing else, right? It's kind of a neat concept, right? Anytime you design an RF filter, right? A low pass filter, a high pass filter, a band pass filter, a notch filter, you're probably thinking, okay, capacitors and inductors and RC time constants and RL time constants and um, you know, poles and zeros. Well, it turns out you can do some of this with, with no capacitors, no inductors, just transmission lines and resistors. So there's some pretty neat stuff here that we're going to figure out that's going to make designing systems for RF electronics, for 5G, for radars, incredibly complex, but also incredibly powerful if we can learn to uh, harness um, under, an understanding of transmission lines. And again, this is probably seems like mysterious black magic to you. Um, in the next several lectures, we're going to be covering exactly what all this means. So uh, this will conclude this uh, first nugget on introduction to AC circuits or AC signals. Um, in the next section, we're going to introduce some of the math we're going to use to describe uh, the signals on these circuits.